Yeah. yeah.
chapter is entitled, I'm in the Army Now. <laughs> Although a search of the complete Uber family tree reveals that five forebears fought in the Revolutionary War and one in the War of 1812, none of them were named Hoover. The Von Hoover, Hoovers, were plain Anabaptist river brethren from Germany. They arrived in 1765. They were pacifists. My grandfather Hoover left the family farms in Franklin County to go to college and medical school before settling in Wrightsville in 1903. My maternal grandfather Fless was born in Holland in 1890, coming to America in 1895. The soldiers were in my grandmother's trees, the shoemaker Millers and the cool ball fucking bushes. My mother's brother, Uncle Jack Fless, served in the United States Navy as a pilot flying torpedo bombers off the USS Randolph during World War II, surviving the Battle of Midway and raids over Tokyo. During the Korean War, I saw younger physician colleagues of my father who had already started their own practices get drafted. On returning from their military duty, they had to start a second time. I decided that I would prefer to go into the military as soon as I finished my residency training. At that time, doctors were eligible for the draft to age 50. Tom Davis, my roommate for the last two years of college and the first year and a half of medical school until we got married, had one child and was expecting their second by the time he graduated. He decided he would go directly into the Army for internship and residency um, because he could not afford many of the internships which uh, were low paying at that time. I had heard about a program called the Ferry Plan, where each of the military services deferred the number of specialists that they felt they would need at the time those individuals completed their residencies. Tom and I went downtown to meet the Army recruiter, of Lieutenant Colonel McBride. He was delighted that Tom wanted to go into the Army as an intern and that I was considering the very plan. We had lots of questions for him, and when he found out that we were both uh, Princeton graduates, he had lots of questions for us. It turned out his son had just been accepted to Princeton and would be entering that fall. He gave Tom all the information that he would need for signing up for an Army internship. While the very plan applications for the next cycle were not yet uh, available, he gave me a copy of the previous year's application. He told me that the new one would probably be the same. He advised me to gather all the data required as soon as possible, and that when the new application was distributed in September, to complete it immediately and send it right back. He informed me that there were a lot of secretaries sitting around uh, doing nothing in the uh, medical assignment office in Washington, D.C. And although there was supposed to be a lottery drawing in January to determine who was selected, the secretaries actually started processing applications as soon as they arrived. Therefore, if the application was received early in the process, I would be in. I did as he instructed me, and in January of 1964, I was notified that I was to be commissioned as a lieutenant in the United States Army. During the remainder of my internship and residency, I did not receive any military pay. I was, however, deferred from the draft. I agreed that I would enter the military upon completion of my residency. They agreed that they would use me in my specialty, internal medicine. Most of my internship classmates thought I was crazy for signing up for the Army at that point. But all those who had not entered the very plan were drafted soon after completing internship. And most of them spent one year of their two-year obligation in Vietnam, as we heard from Jack last month. In early 1967, as I was completing my internal medicine residency at York Hospital, I wanted to state my preference for serving in Germany. I had studied German for two years at Mercersburg and another year and a half at Princeton. My senior thesis involved a lot of research in the German chemical uh, literature. While well, I had exchanged Christmas cards with Colonel McBride in 63 and 64, we had lost contract, contact. I remembered that his son would have been a senior at Princeton. So I contacted him and he informed me that his father was now in Washington, D.C. 
where he oversaw the non-physician medical corps recruitment for the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, RARE. This was of interest to me because I had done some hematologic research and published several articles in this area during my residency at York Hospital. However, since Vietnam was now in full swing, I had learned that they were only accepting physicians in RARE who also had their PhD. So in February of 1967, I took a day off from work and traveled to Washington, D.C. for an appointment with the Army Physician Recruitment and Assignment Office. It was in the old Naval building on uh, the mall. I met with two physician colonels and when asked, I told them that I was interested in going to Germany. They said I might be able to go to Germany. I asked them what else might they suggest. They said, how about Carlisle? <laughs> Knowing that an assignment uh, to the then 28 bed hospital in Carlisle, uh, staffed by one internist and one gynecologist, would be a one year assignment to the other in Vietnam. I told them I still preferred to go to Germany, <laughs> even though it would mean signing up for a third year. As I left the office, I stopped at the secretary's desk and asked if she knew where Colonel McBride's office might be. I had not contacted him in advance. It turns out that his office was the one directly over the office where I was. She called his secretary and Colonel McBride invited me up. After exchanging some pleasantries and discussing what each of us had been doing over the intervening uh, four years, he then asked what I wanted to do when, when I went on active duty with the Army. I told him that because of the hematology experience, I was interested in the work being done at Rare but I heard that I needed a PhD as well as an MD. He confirmed that he couldn't help me there. But he asked where I wish to, where else I wished to go. I replied to Germany. He then stood up and told me to follow him down the hallway into another office. That office was long and narrow. Stephen says the room is wide. There were three desks with two secretaries and the far end was another colonel. Following some small talk, the colonel asked what he could do for us. Colonel McBride said that I would like to go to Germany. The new Colonel asked, what's your first name again, Hoover? I answered, Benjamin. He walked over to one of the filing cabinets, opened it and pulled out a file. There were the quadruplet copies of all the forms that I had filled out applying for the position. He looked through the forms and commented that I studied German. I replied that my senior thesis uh, was mainly from the German literature. He then said, I don't see why you can't go to Germany. Close the file, wrote Germany across the front and put it into a different filing cabinet. I could hardly contain my joy as I drove back to York to tell Anne that we would be going to Germany for three years. The internal medicine residency at York Hospital ended on June 30th. We had already sold our house and divided all of our household goods into three parts. The first to be flown to Germany to be there when we arrived. The second shipment by sea also to Germany, and the third and larger uh, amount uh, going of uh, household goods going to storage with uh, Warner Movie and Redline until we return. As I recall, we stayed those last few days uh, with my parents in Dallas town. We had our flight to San Antonio, Texas, scheduled for July 3rd so that I could start basic training at Fort San Houston on July 5th. July 2nd was a Sunday and I can distinctly recall going to church that morning. I choked up when the patriotic hymns were sung, realizing that we would not be returning to New York for three years. On July 3rd, we flew to San Antonio, rented a car and drove to the apartment in a complex just a few miles from Fort San. The next day, the 4th of July, we went to a nearby park to see the fireworks display, the largest either of us had ever seen up to that point in our lives. On July 5th, 1967, I reported for duty at Fort Sam Houston. While I had been commissioned as a lieutenant in 1964, I was now promoted to the rank of captain. I arrived in my new uniform, but with a hat I had been given by my brother-in-law, Charlie Culver, that he had worn as an ROTC officer. As I signed in, I was asked what he was doing wearing an enlisted man's hat. I was sent to the nearby PX to get a proper officer's hat. 
basic training for medical for officers had just been reinstated a year or so before uh, my arrival. When the Vietnam War heated up, they found that medical officers needed the same basic training as other officers. So we embarked on four weeks of basic training. This included learning to march, to salute, to fire rifles and pistols, to going through the obstacle course under the barbed wire with live gunfire, and to following a nighttime course uh, using only a map and a compass, as well as learning how to take care of wartime wounds. San Antonio, Texas is a very hot place in July and August. The temperature was so high by 10 a.m. that all training requiring significant physical exertion had to be completed before that time. That meant that we had to be in Fort Sam by, five, by 6 a.m. to start our physical activity. One of those activities was teaching us how to march in formation. This took place in the quadrangle, which was surrounded by a three-story building with porches facing the quadrangle on all sides. Platoons of physician officers were taught by army sergeants. Because I had been playing in marching bands since early high school days, this was not a problem for me. However, it was a foreign science to most of my colleagues. It was actually rather funny. When the order was given, some of the physicians would correctly carry it out, but many of them made the incorrect moves. It was so comical that I asked my wife Anne to get up at that early hour the next day to come down to the quadrangle and walk up to the third floor balcony and take pictures. Uh, watching this film is still amusing. We also went to the field on several occasions. Again, it meant getting up early because activities requiring much physical activity had to, to be done early in the day. We were also sent to the tar target range after learning how to take care of our M1 rifles and 45 pistols. And we had to qualify in each. The only experience I had, had in shooting rifles was at Princeton. One of my Roommates was an Army ROTC officer on the rifle team. Each springtime toward the end of the academic year, the ROTC had extra ammunition. They therefore invited the team members, team members to bring guests down to the rifle range to shoot uh, the rifles. The reason was that they wanted to use up all the ammunition because they feared that if they didn't use it all up, they might not get as much the next year. And who knows if they would need more the next year, our government work. We were required to take the obstacle course, rolling on our bellies, carrying our equipment and rifle to get to the other side. This is followed by a nighttime exercise with live fire. There was a wooden tower at one corner of the obstacle course where the training officers could see what was going on. The night I went through, some of the guys picked up rocks and tossed them into the tower. You could hear the training officers cursing those damn doctors. <laughs> Another interesting exercise was a nighttime compass course. After dark, we were taken to point A and given orders to go uh, some distance over the fields and woods to reach point B uh, using only maps and our compasses. We did this in small groups. In order to add realism to the exercise, they had soldiers driving along the road through the middle of the fields in a jeep mounted with a machine gun that would fire blanks at you if they saw you. Apparently on the night before us, one of the teams of doctors came upon the soldiers in the, uh, in the jeep taking a break to smoke. They jumped the soldiers, tied them up and took the jeep. <laughs> the instructors did not think this was funny. And we were clearly instructed that the jeep was there to add realism to the exercise and our object was not to capture the jeep. My group had no difficulty in completing the nighttime obstacle course because Boy Scout days paid off, and some did, some groups did have trouble. Most of us did not have any experience taking care of wartime wounds. The only exception would be the general surgeons who worked in big city hospitals. We actually were given practical experience used doing surgery on goats. The basic training was at times rigorous, at other times just time consuming, but always. Monday to Friday. Our weekends were free. This gave us time to explore the beautiful parks, the entertainment area along the downtown San Antonio River, and for our children, the wonderful San Antonio Zoo. Four weeks later, training was completed, but I had to stay in San Antonio until I received my orders. If we left to go home, which we were allowed to do, we were on leave time. 
and there were horror stories of people who used up a month of leave time before they actually got their orders. Many of the physicians had no idea where they were going to be sent. Some of us knew that we would be going to Germany or other specific countries. In order to be sent to Germany, we had to sign up for the third year, although our basic obligation was only two years. If you signed up for the third year, your family could be sent with you. Several of my colleagues who had European assignments asked what would happen if we decided to bring the family on their own and not sign up for the third year. They were told that their orders would be changed. This then a one-year stateside assignment and a one-year assignment in Vietnam. I felt fortunate to know that Anne and I were going to Germany. Anne's sister had planned her wedding for the first Saturday in August, thinking that we would be have completed our basic training and would be able to make it. Unfortunately, I did not have my orders and I couldn't take a chance on departing and using who knows how much leave time. So I had to pack up Anne, uh, two-year-old Andrew and four-month-old Kate, and take them to the airport to fly back to Philadelphia, where she was met by her parents and was able to be part of her sister's wedding. Meanwhile, I was stuck in San Antonio waiting orders. Another colleague who was in the same situation also sent his wife back home and moved into our apartment. Each day we would drive to Fort San Houston to look at a list which was posted each morning outside the assignments office, office to see if our name was on it. If our name was not on it, we signed in and were free until the next morning. For more than a week, we would return to the apartment complex, spend time reading by the pool or visiting local museums. Finally, a name appeared on the list and I received my orders to report to Germany and was assigned to the 33rd Field Hospital, U.S. Army Hospital in Würzburg, Germany. I flew back to join Anne and the children in New Jersey. Her family's home was only a few miles from Fort Dix and Aguirre Air Force Base, from which we were to fly to Germany. By signing in at Fort Dix each day for the few days before a flight was assigned, I did not lose any leave time there. Army rules caused another problem. Her daughter, Kate, was born on March 14. The Army said she had to have a smallpox vaccination before going to Germany. Unfortunately, Kate had significant atopic dermatitis. Her pediatrician here in York recommended that she not get it. In San Antonio, the Army said she had to get it, but she did not go to Germany. So she got it before leaving Texas. And as predicted, the lesions got infected. Penicillin was ordered, liquid form requiring reconstitution with water and refrigeration. The flight to Germany was uneventful. We landed at Rhein-Main Air Force Base near Frankfurt, where we were met by our host, a fellow physician at the hospital, and his wife, uh, the Rudolphs. When we arrived, there was no housing on post. So we were going to need to find an apartment on the economy. In the meantime, we would be staying in a small hotel in town near the Army base. On the way to the hotel, the Rudolphs took us to see an apartment which they had said had just become available and was one of the nicest ones in town. This is on the first floor of a large house in a very nice part of town, and the landlord lived on the second and third floors. It had a living room, dining room, a small kitchen, master bedroom, a small second bedroom, a toilet room, and a washroom. And a sun porch. The floors were all only. The living room had three walls covered in uh, one pattern of wallpaper and another on a fourth, while the drapes were in a third pattern. It was clean and furnished. It did not immediately excite us after all we had just been on a plane for a long time. <clears throat> the Rudolphs then took us to another apartment in the nearby town of Heidensfeld. This apartment was on the second floor above a flower shop. The windows were open and we recognized the strong odor of manure. <laughs> Out back next door was a farmyard with a manure pile more than a story high. After looking at a third unappealing apartment in town, we decided that the Rudolphs were correct and the first apartment was actually very nice, which it proved to be. The next morning we were taken back to 18 over Dallenberg Bank and signed a monthly renewable lease with the Summers. This would become our home for the next three years. For those first few days, we were in a very nice small hotel, the Klein Nietzsche Hotel, named for the lovely park across the street, which framed the old city where the wall had been. 
Four times a day, we had to go to the desk next to the dining room to get Kate's medicine, which was sent up from the refrigerator in the kitchen below on a dumb waiter. The door goes poured out and the bottle sent back down to the kitchen. The Klein Nietzsche Hotel also introduced us to the German continental breakfast. Of wonderful crisp rolls, butter, marmalade, hard boiled eggs, and coffee. I was signed into the 33rd Field Hospital. This is the hospital building. I was also given and uh, given my office in the Department of Medicine. In this picture, it's hard to see the next one's a little better. On the second floor, it's the one right at the end of the group, the second window uh, when they left part of the building. I was also given permission to go to Sindelfingen to pick up the Mercedes 200 diesel we had pre-ordered months before we left. Several days later, our plans to live off post were approved. Next picture is brighter. And we moved to 18 over Dollarberg Bay, where we were warmly welcomed by the Zahner family. This picture shows the entire hospital. You see the hospital sitting at the top of it. Helicopter pad behind it. The apartment was basically furnished. Fortunately, the trunk that came with us had some pots, pans, and kitchen supplies, but the other shipment and the other essential goods could not be located. As we approached two months, the children were outgrowing their clothes and the weather was getting cooler. It would have been nice to have our high chairs, among other things. One of our friends knew that if the shipment was delayed by six weeks, we could apply for authority to request money to buy what we needed that was missing. I did so, and within a day, the missing shipment was found. <laughs> Two weeks later, delivered. The U.S. Army Hospital in Würzburg was built as a 300-bed hospital for the German Army in 1936 and opened in 1937. With the onset of World War II, the bed capacity was expanded to 700, and by the end of the war, it was said to have 1,500 beds. On May 8, 1945, the U.S. Army's 107th Evacuation Hospital assumed control of the facility. In August of 1965, the 33rd Field Hospital was reactivated to operate the hospital as a 350-bed facility, and its attached units supporting about 35,000 troops and dependents in an area of 5,000 square miles of northern Bavaria. The hospital oversaw five dispensaries, which were in Bergheim, 25 miles to the west, Kitzigen, 15 miles to the southeast, Schweinfurt, 27 miles to the northeast, Bad Kitzigen, 41 miles to the north, and Wilflecken, 56 miles to the north. Most of the troops in this area were part of the 3rd Infantry Division, whose headquarters were on the Leighton Barracks, just a few blocks from the hospital. The hospital itself is a beautiful facility with wide halls, high ceilings, large rooms, lots of windows, and two large open staircases at either end of the center portion. It was set up at about 200 beds, but the sensors was rarely much above 100. Most of the patients were, who were admitted were admitted for illnesses that would have been treated as an outpatient uh, back in the States. But for those living in the barracks, and could not be sent home to mother, so they ended up in the hospital. After four years of medical school and another four years of internship in the internal medicine residency, life in the Army was significantly easier. Most of the time, there were four or five internists assigned to the hospital, which meant we were only on call every fourth or fifth night. We could take call from home, and although you might get a few telephone calls, you rarely had to go in. There were usually 22 to 28 physicians in the hospital, which meant that we only had to be in the hospital overnight as the physician on duty once every 20 to 21 days or so. The three or four regular army, that is career army physicians, had other titles of little importance, which excused them from such duties. Most of those admitted were cases of bronchitis, flu, gastroenteritis, pneumonias, and hepatitis. We also saw a lot of malaria in the soldiers rotating out of Vietnam. They had not taken their kind of malaria tablets as instructed. A patient of mine needed a liver biopsy to establish the diagnosis. I don't recall exactly what, 
It was, but I vividly remember the occasion. I had done many such biopsies during my residency to our hospital without any problems. As I was preparing the patient and the equipment, several foremen asked if they could watch. I agreed. The patient was positioned and the skin was prepped and the area draped with sterile cloths. Next, I injected Novocaine into the skin and to the bridal peritoneum through which the needle would be passed so he wouldn't feel it. The, the McGinney needle to be used for the biopsy is long and thin wall. It is attached to a large syringe. As the needle is quickly thrust into the liver, suction is applied and the needle is withdrawn with a small piece of liver in it. As I picked up the McGinney needle and syringe, one of the corpsmen now they explained, you're not gonna stick that in him, are you? <laughs> Only that little needle, I replied. But when I did thrust it quickly in and out, the patient screamed. It was the only time I ever had that reaction when uh, doing the procedure. I did get the core biopsy, which is uh, put in a fixative solution and sent off to the pathologist. One day when I was on call, I admitted a staff sergeant with a rapid heart rate. The EKG revealed a ventricular tachycardia, a serious rhythm problem that often leads to ventricular fibrillation, which causes sudden death unless cardioverted with a defibrillator. We successfully chopped him back to a normal rhythm, but he kept going back into ventricular tachycardia. Eventually, after giving him rather large doses of quinidine and pronestol, the only antiarrhythmic drugs available at that time, he remained in normal rhythm. Once he was stabilized, uh, we made arrangements to fly him back to the United States for evaluation of Walter Reed Hospital. What a wonderful, we called it. Since it would take uh, several weeks to get a medevac flight, we allowed him to go to his home and built like a, some distance from Burksburg. A week or so later, as I was returning to my office after lunch, I saw him coming up the staircase in the far end and going to my office. I followed him and the sergeant told me, Doc, I think I have it back. He had driven himself 56 miles to the hospital, walked up the flight of steps while in the trickier tachycardia. <laughs> We cardioverted him back into normal rhythms. This time we admitted him and kept him there until he could be directly flown back to uh, Walter Reed. Of course, we never heard anything back from Walter Wonderful. Another patient I will not forget is the first sergeant of a nuclear missile unit not far from Burtsburg. I was the physician on duty covering the emergency room. He had a laceration on his arm, which needed uh, a lot of sutures. I noted that he was even more ruddy than you would expect from an Irishman, which he was. And he had plenty, we had plenty of time to talk as I was suturing him up. I asked him, Sarge, do you have a problem with alcohol? Of course, he denied it. However, several days later, as I was again coming back from lunch, I saw him coming up the far steps and go into my office. As I entered, I greeted him and asked him, Sarge, what is the problem? He replied, I've been thinking about what you asked me the other night. And I realized I do have a problem with alcohol. I suggested that we go back to my office and as we walked down the hallway, asked Sarge, how much are you drinking? To which he replied, I think you better sit down first, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> he then told me that he was drinking a case of German beer every day. The German piece is 20 bottles, each containing a liter of beer. He had to drink five bottles every morning before going to work so that he didn't have withdrawal symptoms. And he was the senior non-commissioned officer for this nuclear armed missile site. He agreed that he needed help and was ready to be admitted. It took us more than a week to have him detoxified. He was very grateful. In appreciation he bought me, brought me some much better winter gear than that supplied by the hospital. <laughs> Fortunately, I never had to go to the field. I also saw a disproportionate number of helicopter pilots and crews. Most had already spent at least one tour of duty in Vietnam. They had their annual flight physical exams at their units, but were taken off flight duty because of irregular heartbeats on their EKGs. They were sent for internal medicine consultation. My exams of their heart were unremarkable, except for the extra beats. Their social history was always the same. They mainly sat around smoking cigarettes and drinking lots of coffee while on duty and drank lots of alcohol when off duty. 
all factors for causing their irregular heart rhythms. My orders were no smoking, no caffeine, no alcohol, and return for reevaluation in seven to 10 days. On re exam, the heart rhythm was regular and EKGs were normal. They followed my orders because they wanted to be back on flight status and the extra pay that went along with it. When the chief financial officer for the base, the lieutenant colonel, and you were too older than I, and graduate of Cornell, presented with a fever and cough. Hospital patient revealed localized rails suggesting a pneumonia. An x ray confirmed it, and, led, and lab work led to a diagnosis of primary atypical pneumonia. He was appropriately treated with the antibiotic erythromycin. While the cough and rails improved, he complained of a persistent headache. I did an ophthalmologic exam, eye exam every morning, and for the first and only time, actually saw papilledema, that is, swelling of the optic nerve develop. This indicated increased intracranial pressure, a medical emergency. I had him evacuated by helicopter to the neurosurgery service in Frankfurt. A spontaneous subdural hematoma, a bleed between the brain and the skull, was diagnosed and surgically evacuated. He recovered fully and we became very good friends. Our official title was the 33rd Field Hospital. A field hospital was made up of three units, each unit having 12 tents, an operating room tent, a recovery room tent, tents for the officers, tents for the enlisted personnel, male and female, mess tent, recovery room tent, and so on. The 33rd Field Hospital went to the field once a year. Our hospital did not have enough equipment to even set up one of the three unit hospitals. They had to borrow tents from other non-hospital units in the area. The hospital had a five ton generator. It sat in our parking lot. We did not have a forklift. We only had deuce and a half trucks. We were hardly a field ready unit. Since the was only 35 miles from the East German border, we assumed that if war occurred, we would probably be behind enemy lines before we knew it started. Therefore, there was no need to have our unit be battle ready. I never went to the field. It was not something you volunteer for. They apparently did not keep lists of who had been to the field on previous years. Part of this is probably because there were four different commanding officers in our hospital during my three years there. However, I'm almost sorry that it was not at the field exercise during my last year. Two other internists from our group uh, were selected. The officer in charge of the exercise was the major Carlos de Santos. He had apparently been passed over for promotion to the then colonel. And he was a green beret, but he was still gung ho. It turned out to be a beautiful day uh, when the unit went to the field. It had been raining continuously for almost a week. But the 12 tents were set up and the mock casualties arrived to be treated. Things had gone quite smoothly, and everyone was just waiting for lunch to be served. Major DeSantos had arranged for the Air Force to send two planes to simulate an attack on the hospital. You can imagine how happy those pilots were to get that assignment. They came in near to top level and as they passed over the hospital, swooped up with afterburners on and the updraft collapsed six of the 12 tents without firing a shot. <laughs> Fortunately, there was only one injury, but it was the Colonel from Heidelberg who was refereeing the effort and was to evaluate the exercise. The tent pole hit her on the leg and opened a gash. So what did they do? They were a field hospital in the field. The helicopter was called in and she was evacuated back to the actual hospital. <laughs> One of the tents that collapsed was the mess tent, which had already been set up for lunch and the buffet tables were overturned. The only ones who got lunch that day were my two internal medicine colleagues who had both brown bagged it. <laughs> That's an interest for you. <laughs> I didn't recall that I wore my fatigue, uh, my field fatigues very often after leaving Fort Sam Houston. For work, I was usually in a green uniform or in the summer in the khaki one. I did have my dress blues, but only wore that to formal candlelight musical concerts in the palace in town during the annual Mozart festival concerts. Our German hosts encouraged that, and the US Army was very much appreciated at that time. Another event that I did not witness, but I know was true, occurred in the office of Dr. Stephen Webster, our dermatologist. The commanding officer of the 3rd Infantry Division had an appointment in his office. 
the staff officers called ahead to make sure that the general didn't have to wait before coming in. The commander was General George Senna Jr. The German word Senna means mustard. He was short, very well built. His head and his crew cut always looked like he had just come from uh, the barber's shop. His green fatigues were always starched and well pressed with a sharp crease. He had uh, come to see Dr. Webster because of a skin lesion. Dr. Webster uh, thought it should be removed, but it was larger than the dermatologist would remove. So he called up to the surgical department. The surgeon available was Dr. Donald Chu. Don was from San Mateo, California, and was a general surgeon working for Kaiser Permanente. He was a very good surgeon. But like many other physicians who were drafted into the Army, he would. He did not always play or look the part. Indeed, he was in his khaki uniform, which was clean, but hardly pressed. Don walked into Steve's office, and the general stood up. Don turned to him and said, that's all right, General. You don't have to stand up for me. <laughs> <laughs> they say it's the only time you ever saw the General's features. <laughs> Surgery was performed and the lesion was benign. <laughs> when we arrived in Würzburg, we were instructed to always keep emergency supplies on hand. This included blankets, canned goods, etc. If the order went out that civilians were to be evacuated, our spouses were to load the supplies in the car and drive to Rhein-Rhein Air Force Base near Frankfurt. However, the year before we arrived, they decided to have a mock evacuation. The families were instructed to drive to the airport. When the Germans saw the Americans packing up and leaving, they packed up and left as well. They produced the largest traffic jam ever witnessed on the Autobahn. They did not repeat such an exercise during the three years we were there. Somehow I managed to avoid any helicopter flights. Frequently, patients from the outlying units were flown into the hospital, particularly for the surgical service. But there were opportunities when patients were flown from our hospital to the larger, more specialized services at Frankfurt or Landstuhl. I never volunteered, preferring to keep my two feet on the ground. But I did volunteer to take a medical evacuation, evacuation flight back to the States near the end of my tour to take the oral exam in internal medicine in Baltimore and to close on a house here in York, one that was one block from where we had previously lived and had where we had been guests on the first floor, but one where my wife had never been in the basement or the second floor. How's that for trust? <laughs> Although I had no deaths in my service during the three years in Hertzburg, the hospital itself was not as fortunate. A young soldier came into our hospital with abdominal pain. We submitted to the surgical service of the chief of surgery, who was a career army officer. Rather than operating that night, he watched the patient overnight and operated the next morning to find that the appendix had already ruptured. He consulted the then chief of the Department of Medicine, also a career army officer, who gave him an inappropriately large doses of genomycin, a new antibiotic at that time. The patient went into liver failure and died. It was an unnecessary death. The two internal medicine colleagues and I called it to the hospital commander's attention. As a result, I was named the chief of medicine with my former boss placed under me. I was a major, the former chief was a lieutenant colonel. The official reason for the change was that the former chief was also technically the assistant hospital commander and that those duties, whatever they were, took up too much of his time to also head the medical department. Shortly thereafter, he was transferred to Washington to be part of the White House medical staff. Hopefully his duties there were only administrative. The other death involved a young, a young woman who was accompanying her husband as he was studying at an intensive immersive German language school some distance south of Wurzburg. He became very ill she became very ill and was admitted to the German hospital there. Normally, we at the Army Hospital were not allowed to take care of American citizens unless they were military dependents. However, the woman's condition deteriorated rapidly and the German hospital could not find the cause. Somehow, the German authorities agreed to the young woman's family's request that she be transferred to our hospital. She was admitted to the OBGYN service because she had a positive pregnancy test. One of the 
My colleagues was consulted. Within 12 hours, the diagnosis was established. She had an identity form mole, which if it had been diagnosed earlier, there was treatment which could have been life-saving. However, she died of the next day. We were, however, authorized to treat retired military personnel. And there were a few of those in Würzburg. It seemed that a disproportionate number of them were married to German women who owned bars. As a result, we did see cases of alcoholic liver disease. As an intern, I was commissioned as a first lieutenant. When I went on active duty, I was promoted to captain in the US Army Hospital at Birchburg. There were 25 to 28 positions most of the time. The time I arrived, the three rear army officer positions were the only majors or lieutenant colonels, while the rest of us were captains. Our regular army peers at our age had entered the army after they graduated from college. As a result, they were almost all majors and some lieutenant colonels. This was during the Vietnam War and the army was trying to encourage physicians to stay in the army. They could not just pay physicians more money, so they effectively did so by giving physicians the date that they graduated from college as their date for calculating promotions and years of service in the military, and therefore their pay grade. So shortly after I arrived, I was promoted to major. By the time I resigned my commission three years after going on active duty, I was paid as a major with 11 years in service. At the time I left Germany, my name was on the promotion list for lieutenant colonel. It was, estimated, it was estimated that my slot would come up in another three or four months, but that was not enough to keep us in the Army. We did have 30 days of paid leave in the Army each year, in Europe each year. We told our families that if they wanted to see us, they had to come to Germany, and most did. We could not take more than two weeks off at a time. That gave us 16 days in England and Scotland, 16 days in Italy, 16 days in Spain and Portugal, 16 days in Scandinavia, as well as short trips to Holland every spring during tulip season, and to Switzerland, Austria, Belgium, Luxembourg, Liechtenstein, France, all within a day's drive. And administratively, for presenting papers at the annual Army Medical Conferences in Garmisch, religious retreat in Birch's Garden, and taking the overnight troop train from Frankfurt across East Germany for a long weekend in Berlin were all in addition to our regular vacation leave. The US Army ran a troop train from Frankfurt to West Berlin across East Germany. To justify it, it had to carry troops. Military in West Germany were encouraged to make the trip. It was administrative leave. It included hotel rooms, tours of West and East Germany, and a per diem for other expenses. As a ranking officer in the day we rode it, Ann and I had the private suite. The other rooms contained uh, four bunk beds. We reached the East German border about midnight and stopped while they changed engines to East German engines. The area was illuminated higher than day, and we could see the Russian soldiers in the shadows with their weapons. They were not concerned that we would get off the train, but the East Germans might try to get on it. In order to be on the train, we had to have what are called flag papers, so called because the flag at the top of the orders and the rest of the form written in English, French, and Russian. And these had to be shown to the Russian troops that came on the train to make sure that we uh, were all uh, properly certified to travel across East Germany. We got to Berlin. Uh, we crossed checkpoint Charlie and the army bus to tour East Berlin, the highlight being the bus of Nefertiti in the National Museum. And quickly learned German, the German language, thanks to courses given by on post by the University of Maryland. She took the beginning and intermediate courses while I took the advanced course. The only time that the advanced course was given in the three years we were there because they could never get five additional military people to sign up for it. We became close friends with uh, the husband and wife who were our teachers. And Anne was very active in the local German-American society. 
And while I still had a larger vocabulary and conversational impairment, it was soon better than mine. There was a nursery school on the post. And when they found out that Anne had been a teacher, she was asked to serve on the board and was soon the president of it. The post regularly held by one of the general's wives. At one point, the post engineers announced that they were moving, going to cha change the nursery entrance from the quiet side street where it was to the one on the front on the very busy through street where military as well as civilian traffic was heavy and went to the post engineering office and told the commanding officer what a bad idea and dangerous idea it would be to have parents parking and getting their kids in and out of their cars on the main road politely and forcefully. Finally, the commander said, just what rank is your husband anyway? <laughs> and replied, what does that have to do with it? <laughs> the interest was never changed. <laughs> officers were expected to go to the officers club to celebrate New Year's Eve. But the first year, our landlord invited us to come up to their place for dinner and to see the fireworks at midnight. We accepted. We overlooked the old city and at midnight, there were fireworks being set off everywhere uh, for nearly half an hour. German building codes are very strict. Houses are all stone or concrete and have tile roofs. So it was rare to have a, a fire in Würzburg. In fact, Würzburg was about uh, 130,000 people that had one fire station in the three years we were there. There was only one major fire and that was in a mattress factory. The display of fireworks was so impressive that we decided to host a large New Year's Eve party at our place for the next two years. In the last year, even our hospital commander came instead of going to the office as well. And then I did consider staying in the army for another year. We enjoyed living in Germany. There was a lot more of Europe that we wanted to see. There were several compelling factors to make us want to return home. As spring of 1970, a group of Americans were taken hostage in a hotel in Beirut, Lebanon. Several of my colleagues were given orders to collect their battle gear and report to Rhein-Main airfield for possible trans transport to Lebanon. As a truck left the hospital, one of our Jewish doctors on board was heard to ask, which side am I fighting for? <laughs> They boarded aircraft and sat on the runway waiting for orders to depart. Fortunately, the hostages were released and those on the plane we boarded and returned to their home bases. This only brought home to us the fact that our comfortable life in Germany could be abruptly interrupted. In addition, my mother was not well. She had developed a weakness and pain, which was thought to be due to cervical disc disease, and, and which several surgeries did not help. It was then found to have a, a, a rare disorder called syringomyelia, the only place I ever saw practice and uh, uh, had just spent a, more than a month in the intensive care unit at the University of Maryland Hospital. <coughs> Today, a CAT scan or an MRI would make that diagnosis very easy. And I was approaching my 33rd birthday. It was time that I get a real job. It was time to start my medical practice at York. It was time to go home. The hospital commander called me in the office and asked if I wanted a meritorious service medal or a letter of recommendation. Not knowing exactly what I was doing when I was discharged, I, I chose the letter, which is on the table there. I never used it for that purpose, but I did have it framed in one, of my, one wall of my examining room uh, for the next 37 years. On the evening before I departed, for the first time in my three years there, the hospital had a retreat to honor me and Jack Earhart, an OBGYN doc, who was also leaving. Of course, the Army cannot have a retreat without having a rehearsal the day before the event. After lining us up with that attention, the order was given at ease. The first sergeant turned to face the doctors and said, that means you stand like this as you assume the pose. Some things have not changed since we left Fort Sam Houston. On arrival at McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey, I 
signed into Fort Dix, the Army base next door, and resigned my commission on the 17th day of August 1970, after three years, one month, and 16 days of active duty in the U.S. Army uh, Medical Corps. Uh, I was a veteran. Uh, I have a few other pictures I will uh, show you. This is uh, the, the hospital. Uh, not all of it was patient as uh, some of the wings on the end uh, they were, had uh, rooms for enlisted personnel. This is the back of the hospital. That's the helicopter building over to the right. Next, this is the main entrance to the hospital. Helicopter could arrive rather regularly. I was amazed by the skill of the pilots of bringing patients into a very small area behind the hospital. <coughs> this is my office outside. That is my office. <laughs> Next. Uh, this is the house on the Cobra Dollar Bay. Area. So we were on the first floor, the landing room was on the second floor, where there were some bedrooms on the third floor, and the storage were all over there. So next, I rented the two windows on the third floor where I was studying for my boarding. So that's the next picture. There I am at the desk on the third floor, looking out of the, uh, the, the city. Not a bad place to live. Next. This was uh, my wife, Anne. Son Andrew and Lori Kate, uh, taken from the Hillary in 1968. I was an engineer who was just about one at that time. That's it. Oh, and this is the hospital today. Uh, the Army closed the hospital uh, more than a decade ago uh, when troops left uh, that area. And, uh, Today, it is a uh, high end uh, luxury apartments, condos. So that's the sort of test of time. Really well. So that's my story of uh, my three years in the Army Medical Corps. house when his uncle, his wife, who came from East Germany. Once you reach age 65, they didn't care if you left because they weren't going to send you to retirement. 
check uh, the East German as it probably sent it to the West. So, but East Germans could come visit their relatives in West Germany, but they had to go back to keep getting their uh, retirement benefits. And uh, I met him, he just broke down time. It's, it's, it's the Germans at that time, West Germans and East Germans were really appreciating that the Americans were there. So, so when did when did they? Or maybe I'm thinking. You said I was I was older. All all the positions were older because we were all in medical school uh, in our residency. So it was a really really great group of doctors because we all just finished our training and probably never started. And, and, uh, and we all most of us wanted to travel. And, uh, so uh, during the three years I was there, I drove 60,000 miles, uh, which is a lot of miles in Europe. So, uh, so there, there, there was no more with, and I mean, maybe I'm thinking not far enough back in time, but I mean, when was Hitler still there? <laughs> <laughs> well, that ended in 45. This was, uh, I went there in 67, okay. and the wall was so, down for another 15 years. Yeah. So, so you, did, you didn't see any reaction from the Germans? Well, the city of Würzburg was, still had a lot of evidence of the bombings of uh, World War II. Fortunately, Würzburg was bombed by the uh, British force in the Irish. But in the city of Würzburg, uh, there were over the 5,000 people who died in the 20 minutes uh, with the bomb. Uh, and most, of the, and it was fire, most of the damage was not from explosive force, it was due to uh, the fires that were set off. And uh, but the buildings there were mostly reinforced concrete or stone, and it was only the interiors that burned out. Many of them were rebuilt exactly as they were before. But uh, the Cold War was very much in effect. Uh, troops were on maneuvers. Uh, I took care of soldiers who were up in the truck, which was right on the East German border. And they said routinely the East German tanks would come heading right to the border at the last minute, turn away, and we never knew whether they were going to keep coming. So things were, things were still active. Going through East Berlin, where you could just see the huge difference between East and West Berlin. And on the bus tour, we took it was quite evident that they only took us to a few uh, rehab blocks because we realized at one point that we've gone through the same intersection from three different directions. <laughs> <laughs> After you got out, did you have to do any reserve duty and did you ever make a uh, lieutenant colonel? No, I, no, I resigned my commission. I, I, I wanted to that was it. put that behind me. Look, in the family picture, you look very German. So I'm yeah. guessing you fit right in, right? Yes, yeah, so well, we lived on the economy for all three years and we had lots of German friends, particularly uh, became friends with a lot of German doctors at the University uh, of Winsburg Hospital and uh, went to the the medical society balls each year there, and, uh, which can, can be interesting with the language problems. So this was a formal black tie uh, ball that I went to, and my uh, her, her uh, German teacher was right across from me. And she looks at me and she says, "Oh Ben, your fly is crooked." And I didn't know where to look or what to do, <laughs> so I realized that the German word for uh, bow tie is the same word for fly. That's <laughs> 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 my bow tie that was <laughs> were, were you able to attend church services? Uh, no, but there, there, was a, there was a post chapel, which was a Southern Baptist uh, predominantly, and um, the hospital had its own chapel, and uh, the, the uh, chaplain there was an Episcopal priest. And as a Episcopalian, that still the Episcopalian at that time. And uh, so we attended church regularly. 
which is why I was authorized to go to the religious retreats down the purchase garden. Okay. I even gave a story. Thank you. Thank you. And, and you said you were at the University of Maryland? Uh, university. No, I, I went to Penn for medical school, Princeton undergraduate, but um, the University of Maryland gave courses at the post in Germany. And uh, that included uh, the German courses. So Anne had never spoken German before, but uh, so she took the beginning and intermediate courses and uh, she became very good at it. Yeah, that's a good law school. I remember falling out of the car, ending up <laughs> down there, back down there, just working down there. Uh, your hospital that time, the time I was in the present, Jack and I were there, we didn't have uh, a cardiac uh, <coughs> program other than EKGs and, uh, or endocrine programs. So I actually commuted down to uh, University of Hospital in Baltimore for six months, three months in cardiology, and three months in endocrinology. Did you do the same? Yes, he did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You, you commuted to university. Oh, extra extra specialty. And I never regretted coming back to New York uh, for the internship and residency. Or where did you where did you practice medicine here? I, I didn't know the I, I came back and opened a, an office in Dr. Row and rented three rooms from Dr. Langston, you know, the GYN man who had actually delivered me. And uh, three years later I took on the, the first partner and we built an office out of Dr. Dr. Internal Medicine Consultants. I retired 15 years ago and there were about 17 of us in the group. It's now called uh, well span hospitals. Everything has been genericized. Did we find a switch to go from all those places to York? <laughs> it's, it's quite a little. Quite different. <laughs> quite different. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, this coffee, 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 this coffee,